Good morning and welcome. This is Microsoft Virtual Academy. We're broadcasting live from Washington and we're going to talk today about development in XAML. I'm excited here to be I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to be here with Uni. Uni, take just a second, introduce yourself and I'll introduce myself out. Oh, absolutely. I'm Uni Ravindranathan. I'm a program manager lead and I lead a small team that builds XAML tools and Visual Studio in Blend. Yeah. So but not just Blend, but also inside oh, Visual Studio and absolutely. all the tooling that we'll talk about today. Uh, my name is Jerry Nixon. I, I slide through the, go through the deck here. Uh, my name is Jerry Nixon. I'm a developer evangelist from Colorado, and uh, I talk to developers, both professional developers and student developers at schools. And uh, just like you who are watching today, we talk about XAML a lot, building on Windows Phone, building on Windows 8, and building on the desktop as well. So today is going to be an exciting day. We uh, have a packed agenda, and uh, it's kind of cool. I want everybody to kind of pay attention to all the different pieces here because the last one is extremely nice. Uh, so we'll start by talking about all of the tooling that we provide to XAML developers. And so the first two sessions really walk through um, the editing experience and the edi editing tooling given to um, developers inside Visual Studio. And so uh, there's, a, there's a developer who uh, is building XAML applications using XAML as a technology. Both Blend is a tool that you'll use and Visual Studio. We don't want to shortchange all the tooling that's there in Visual Studio and some of the new neat features in 2013 as well. And then uh, we'll go into Blend and we'll have uh, two full sessions of Blend, one before the meal break and then one after. And uh, then we'll go into actually building a store really from scratch. We'll go all the way from soup to nuts using all the tooling the way it's kind of meant to be and uh, we'll kind of talk about options that we have as well with uh, different types of data. And then the final one will be just some fun things that Uni and I really like to show, uh, some of the features in the tooling, as well as just some techniques that are sort of cool inside XAML. And uh, after that, we'll take a moment and uh, have a, a full Q&A that's live. So if you have a question about Visual Studio, you have a question about Blend, you have a question about XAML, um, you can ask that anytime during the day, and it'll be resolved um, or answered and, or kind of triaged by uh, the, anybody who's on the chat line at the time. But if you have a really core question, uh, save that until the end, bring it to us, and we'll be monitoring the chat and answering it live during that last session as well. So right now, though, let's go on into uh, the first session. And uh, but, oh, before we do, let me do set just a moment of expectation here for whoever the viewers are. And so uh, this is a difficult thing for us to do. We had a little bit of a struggle trying to decide on who the right viewers should be? Is it the beginner developer or is it that well-seasoned developer wanting to use the tooling at a high level? And the reality is it's for both and it's, it's a difficult thing to do to talk about this tooling and, and target a specific um, audience as well. So if you're a brand, if you're a, 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 a student developer or a, a new developer to XAML, this is going to feel very comfortable to you. We won't move too quickly and we won't, um, you know, try not to uh, uh, take concepts for granted, but at the same time, we also won't move too slowly. So if you're a seasoned developer, you'll have plenty of things to get out of this as well. And one of the neatest things, and I hope it will be one of the things you'll take from it, is the ability to see the tooling used the way it was sort of meant to be used. And, um, and so be sure and, and queue up your questions if you have them, but that's sort of the expectation. If you're an intermediate developer, this is ideal for you, but we should have plenty for everybody at the same time. Um, if you are unfamiliar with C-sharp, this might be a little bit of a struggle. You can program using XAML both with C++, C-sharp, and Visual Basic. But today, we'll be focusing solely on C-sharp. And so that way, you at least know. Yeah, All and, right. the, and the same thing about Windows Store as well. Like We're mm. going to be doing a lot of demos using Windows Store apps today, particularly targeting Windows 8.1. But that doesn't mean if you are targeting Windows 8 or Windows Phone, WPF, or Civilite, the same techniques also apply there as well. Right, so we'll be talking about store apps um, regularly, but all of this applies down. And there'll be some slight variations, and we'll try and touch on those when they actually happen. Um, again, this is a, an MVA course, so just for being part of this course, you get our voucher code that it gives you the 50 MVA points for this event. So uh, our voucher code is BLEND, easy enough to remember. I'm not sure if it's case sensitive or not. Let's, uh, let's assume it is, capital B, everything else is lower. Beautiful. All right, Uni, so uh, let's start thinking about Visual Studio 2013. Hasn't been out all that long. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, nice features that were introduced for, um, for developers, that, uh, from, even just from 2012 to 2013. So let's start just first thinking about uh, XAML. And so here is uh, just a quick introduction to XAML. 
And if I were to ask you, what is XAML? I'm sure you, your family asks you what XAML is. How do you boil it down? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so the way I see it is uh, it's a declarative um, UI construction language. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of build, declare the, 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 the user interface structure using some constructs. Um, if, you're an, if you're familiar with XML, that's all you pretty much need to know. It's, it's declarative. Um, it has a lot of, it has a ton of great features like, uh, you know, the ability to do data bindings and animations. You can style your controls. Um, but, the, but the beauty of the entire thing is you can sort of build an app um, by using declarative UI and then writing some code that sort of ties together different UI constructs. So it's it's a really powerful um, you know declarative way of creating user interfaces, and you can build apps for Windows, Windows Phone, Windows Store, you know Sybilite, and so on and so forth. And it's valuable to have a, a technology that's declarative. I mean, we say that word, but it's actually very very valuable. One way, one reason is we can build designers around a declarative language. Yeah, absolutely. We have some really powerful design tools that expose all of these capabilities, make it really easy for you to style controls and you know create you know, data scenarios where you visualize data that's coming from a service. Yeah. All of that is made really easy by this declarative language. And XAML as a framework is actually quite powerful because it's, it's very um, user experience oriented as well, right? It easily in integrates animations, it scales beautifully, it has a lot of features that, not, now, now, not just in the store, but every, everywhere you see XAML, we have this animation. Yeah, I mean, you absolutely can build an app uh, for Windows that sort of you know, has the personality of Windows. It has like that smooth, you know, fluid UI. You know, it's all connected to services. You sort yeah. of like are interacting with the full immersive environment and so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of contrasts, I suppose, a little bit with Windows Forms and, you know, animations and things like that in WinForms was always difficult. I mean, very, very difficult. And it, they're almost built in and native inside XAML, so you can really build an Yeah, I mean, um, there is a little bit of a learning curve if you're a Windows, Phone de Windows Forms developer, mm -hmm. but at the same time, C Sharp should be really familiar to you. Yeah. The whole notion of controls and abstractions around controls and data should be very familiar to you. So there is a lot of familiarity. But at the same time, you know, there is a little bit of a learning curve, but we really hope today's session should help with that. And we'll show all day, but the designer really helps developers too. I mean, it's not just something that you struggle through. The designer is really a helper. It's really robust and really smooth. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I have uh, all kinds of cool things to show. I'm going to open up Visual Studio, and I think let's just walk through and show if I'm a XAML developer, let, what, would I, uh, what would be my experience? And so I'll uh, just start up a new project here. Actually, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, and I'd like to just take a quick second, is um, all the code that, that Uni and I are going to be working with today is available for any of you to look at almost live. And so if you go to xaml.codeplex.com, that's X-A-M-L, xaml.codeplex.com, all of our solution is there. I'm going to be editing it right now, checked out. Every, between every session, I'll go ahead and check it in. So all the work that we're doing right now, you can go and get it within an hour of, of us doing it. So it should be just during the break, I'll check everything in and you can go get it. So I'll, I have that solution open right now. I'll start a brand new project. Or no, I won't start a brand new project. I'll open up, let's say, the space project and we'll make some changes together. Absolutely. All right, so I have, a, uh, I have my main page here. Uh, should we start inside XAML or start inside C Sharp? I think we should start with XAML. All right, let's do it. So uh, I'll double click my XAML file. It's main page XAML. It'll open up the designer for me. I will close my error list and let's go it's just a uh, it's a page that shows the cast of star trek of star trek i love it all right we got, so we're not going to use the, de the designer at first we're going to just start coding in xaml and i think if i'm a developer i'm a xaml developer um, I'm coding XAML. It's not. We don't have an expectation that the, that they won't code in XAML. Yeah, I mean, we find users who are extremely productive by sort of editing their XAML by hand, and we've done a lot of work to sort of help them out. That doesn't mean you must fall back to XAML. We have a very uh, very powerful design tool which we'll cover in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, let's kick off by showing some of the new things we've done for the user who likes to type their XAML. Perfect. All right, so I'm inside, let's say, a grid right here. And uh, what are some of the first things that we can do? I can add another grid inside this grid. And uh, I think if, I was a, if, I'm a, if I'm a seasoned developer, one of the things I know is that as I'm typing, I get this autocomplete. I've always had a little bit of this autocomplete. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a very particular autocomplete, right? It was, it, you either type it correctly or you get, or you get that uh, XML comment block out, right? That's kind of the result if you don't get anything. 
but um, it's a lot more flexible now. Right? So now I have, uh, like for example, let's say I, what I wanted to add was a, um, a stack panel, right? If I, if I mistakenly typed um, a stack with a K panel, it still shows up for me, right? It's still very, very flexible for me. That's, that's an important improvement, I think, because I, you know, I type a lot of XAML, and I make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this is an idea that if, you're, if you have done a lot of C-sharp coding, the C-sharp language service does the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, where it sort of tries to do the right thing as far as matching. We try to bring some of those ideas into the XAML editor as well, because we want to sort of maintain that continuity of experiences. Right. It's sort of a, it's sort of a fuzzy match. Yep. And uh, you know, sometimes I might, what I might want is, if this was a grid, let's say it was for the background, what I might want to add is a, um, like a solid color brush here. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and what I have this option now in C sharp, but now I have it here is this camel, so I can say solid color brush, and it'll bring it down. And of course, it's farther down in the list, but here's solid color brush, and it's gone through and found everything not only that matches this camel casing, but also everything that kind of matches the whatever the type that belongs inside this property. Absolutely, a lot, a lot of nice nice power there as well. What's something else I can show? Um, if I have a, sometimes you might nest grids like this. And so uh, each one, there's a lot of different things that I'm looking at. And, uh, you know, a developer has come in and said, you know, it's kind of confusing. So this is uh, section two, and they've done a good job of going in and commenting section one, two, and three. And uh, I go through and I look at it, and I think, now, um, I need to, for the time being, I just need to comment out section one, two, or just section two and three. And so to comment those out, I might have nested comments all throughout my XAML. And it becomes really painful because I'll, I'll add, if I, if I do this manually, I'll add this at the top, and then I'll go to the bottom. And I'll add this close at the bottom. Of course, that's not valid inside XML. And uh, there, it's a painful way to do it, but Visual Studio kind of helps us out so we don't have to do it this way. I can select all of it, and I can either use the keystroke. I like the keystroke. Yep. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a control E C to add a comment <laughs> for myself. But I can also use it up in the menu, and I actually don't have the right command bar to show. Oh, it's that. right there. It's, it's oh, right here. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Control E C. It even tells me there. So if I do it, it does everything that I would have needed to have done as a developer. Right? Or you could right click, and there's a there's a context menu, which is the way I kind of do it as well. I think. Uh, is that right? Or maybe I'm not right. Oh, okay. Right. Maybe, maybe it's not there. Ah. Hmm. So, but you know, right clicking there did show us one interesting thing. I don't have any right now, and you can talk to it. But uh, if I'm right here, ready to ready to code, I could type in any of the controls I want. Of course, I could drag them from the toolbox as well. But some of the things I do, I might want to use snippets for. And uh, we've we haven't really had snippets. We've had support for snippets using a little third party controls that are not controls, but third party extensions to Visual Studio. But now that's built in. We can use snippets right here inside uh, XAML. I can just say right click, and I can. Choose one or two. I can, in this case, I'll say the expansion snippet, and here I can select whatever tag I want. But this is just in the, and in fact, let me show it real quick. It's right here, tools, and it's in the uh, code snippet manager right here. Control K, Control B will take me to it. I can drop over to XAML, which was never there before. Right, it's really exciting, and then go into this folder. I can add as many snippets as I want, and if I work on a team. I can have this folder be a shared network resource as well, so we can all have snippets as well. So there'll be there aren't uh, snippets right here. What's the story with that? So if you go to XAML, I don't know if you can bring up the internet and go to yeah. XAMLsnippets.codeplex.com, we have shipped a large number of snippets that you could potentially uh, download and install uh, into that folder that you just pointed out. We have some instructions on this site as well. For example, we are shipping all of the styles and templates that are commonly used for Windows and WPF and Windows Phone. Um, as snippets. So you know, if you are like a XAML-focused developer that doesn't write, like to use the design tools, we have a lot of snippets for all of the styles and things like that. So you can sort of stay in your XAML editor and sort of extract styles and templates all using uh, snippets. So this will give me dozens of really useful snippets as well as a template to make my own as well. Absolutely. Which is probably one of its most valuable pieces as well. Yep, I've downloaded this myself. Excellent. Now this is, um, this is not written by... Uh, a community partner, and this is written by you guys, actually. Absolutely, and we are looking for you know ideas that people like if if they really are missing something and they're sort of finding themselves spending a lot of time typing their XAML. We're looking for feedback on sort of adding new snippets to the gallery as well, and we are accepting community contributions and things like that as well. Nice, very nice. That's a big and powerful piece. I think I, I really like it a lot. All right, walk me through some other features here. Uh, how about we show like. Um, 
you know, the, the fact that we update the end tag when you decide to sort of update oh, yeah. your starting so tag. So this is a handy grid, but what I really meant to do was a stack panel. So I could select stack panel, and when I do, conveniently, right here is at the end. More often than not, I'm adding a, a text block, and uh, I mistakenly close it like this. And, you know, you don't really need to put anything inside the content of the text block, so I like to just close it, and to me that's a great feature, it just pulls that down uh, out of the way. If, if stack panel were here and I had these two together, even if I was inside stack panel dot background, it, even here I can do the same thing as I would change it. It follows it oh, absolutely, yeah. all the way around. And that's, I like that a lot. I mean, obviously you wouldn't do it this way, but... I and could. often what happens is you have like large snippets that are nested, you spend a lot of time like scrolling, finding the closing snippet, and so on and so forth. That's right. Um, so the closing tag is what I meant, uh, and then sort of updating it. We sort of do all that for you now. Yeah, that's really nice. And I, I just be honest, when I talk to my web developer friends, you know, they had this last version, and uh, it always made me so so jealous. You know, I love the fact that we have it now. Beautiful. All right. Help me out. Give me a, another one here. How about we show some of the really awesome go-to definition features? Oh yeah, that's great. All right, so uh, I'm going to have a. I'm gonna ha well, that's interesting. I'm going to have a text block here, and uh, one of the things that I can do to a text block is uh, I'll go over to its properties and set its style, and its style will be. Um, actually, let me define a style because that'll be that'll be the first cool thing I can do. I'll go into the the XAML the app XAML. And uh, here I can start adding new, um, new styles. So I'll create a quick style, and I'll target it to my text block. Text block, just like so. And we'll say this is uh, Jerry's style. And what's special about my style is that I have a setter that says that the font size is always 100. Right? I know, I'd go big or go home is the way I'm thinking about it. And uh, the, now let's see, what am I doing? I think you do need the, since there's the merge dictionary, let's take out that resource uh, dictionary. There we go, for perfect. A second. Yep, that's right, that was left over. There we go. And uh, so I'll jump over here and go back to my text block. I'm gonna set its property, or its style, but I don't have to go to the designer to do it. I don't yep. have to go over to the properties to do it. Here I can say the style, and here I can say stat, it's a static resource. And look, there it is right there in the list like I would hope to have. Yeah, so we sort of unify all of the styles that are applicable in that scope. They could be coming from Windows, they could be your own styles, they could be coming from a dictionary that's in scope. We sort of show you the full list and we filter down to things that are really applicable. In this case, we have sort of only allowed you to apply or view styles that are applicable to text blocks. Right. And hence, you're seeing your style, you can apply it right from there. Beautiful. And what's even better is um, this style Let's say it does come from a dictionary, and maybe it's a linked dictionary. It's far away. You know, I don't really know. I'm, maybe I'm new to this project, and I don't really know um, where the other developers keep all the styles. Finding this style in Visual Studio 2012 was a little spelunking challenge. Right? Well, you pretty much have to do Control Shift F, find everything in the solution, then wait through that, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but now I'm a, now we don't have such a thing now. Now it's a single keystroke. That's F12. Yeah. And this one certainly is on the right-click context menu as well. Aha. Let's just do it with the right context menu then. All right. Go to definition. And when it does, it'll take me all the way to the correct file and then navigate me to the correct style as well. Yeah. Do you want to create a based on style to sort of show you like we let you walk the entire tree, which is a very common scenario? Sure. Let's do it. I'll create, a, uh, I'll create an uni let's style. Cre yeah, let's, yeah, exactly. All right. Very good. All right. So we will have a based on. Static resource, yep. Yours will be based on mine with one, ex one change to it. You always say it needs to be bigger. There we are. Perfect. So I can select now either Jerry style or Uni style. It'll change the font size for me. So I'll say Uni style right there. It fills it in. Now when I hit F12, will it take me to Jerry style or will it take me to Uni style? Uni style. I would hope we so, hope. absolutely. There we are. But now, this might be defined and based on a resource. And it could be completely in a different dictionary or something like that, right? And just like before, I go here, hit F12, and it'll take me up to this style now. So that's perfect. And so that's just me hitting F12, navigates me to wherever that is, and keeps going up and up and up. 
So this is just the beginning, right? We're talking about navigating inside the inside XAML declarations, so moving around through all of the assets there. I could do the same thing though inside C sharp assets as well. Oh, absolutely. And Visual Basic assets, and I mean, when, of course. And uh, so this will, I can, uh, let's see, I can do a quick binding here. So I'll bind it to text, and it's called binding. Now, this list is also slightly different. Uh, this list used to be uh, not, it used to not include all of the items inside my data context. If I wanted to be able to do a quick data binding and know that I was getting the syntax pro correctly, done correctly, I would have to go into the properties of the text box, and then click the little uh, value indicator on the right, and uh, in fact, let me just show really quickly. I used to, and I still can, of course. Oh, absolutely, you can. I can go right here, say create binding, and it will do all the correct filtering for me. I could select, say, this title was what it was going to be. And I say go, and it sets it to title, and I know that I didn't type it correctly. Uh, I mean, I know that I did, did get it correct, and I didn't type it incorrectly. By the way, we have a full section on data binding. We'll go into the basics of some of these things right, in detail. We're going to go quickly right now. But even now, I can say TI, and I can see that title is right there. It, pull, it knows my data context. It knows all the members of it. In fact, if I hit dot after it, it'll start then diving into that object. If it's a rich, complex object, it'll get all of its uh, nested types. And in this case, it's a string, and it only has a link. But it does allow me to go through all of these pieces like that. That's new and very powerful inside Visual Studio that keeps you from having to go to the uh, properties dialog, unless you just want to, you certainly still can. Oh, absolutely. Do you want to do an F12 on the title? Oh, that's a great idea. So F12, let's go to definition. And where does it take me? It takes me into my view model all the way to the uh, the title property where I am. Awesome. That so we have sort of made it really easy for you to navigate. I mean, it's, it's really common if you're a XAML developer to sort of do most of your work in your C-sharp code, absolutely normal, and then go back, fall back to the XAML you know, uh, UI declaration for creating your UI. So navigating back and forth, you add a property, you can zoom it in your XAML and back and forth is a very common workflow and we've made it really easy for you to do this. So if you wanted to go back to mainpage.xaml and select the object uh, that's specific to the data context up there, so there's a base view, like if you hit, let's go hit F12 on that. All right. So in this case, we are actually navigating you to the actual class that's specifying the data for this particular page. So you have made it really easy for you to back, jump back and forth uh, to classes and properties and types and things like that. This is endlessly valuable to developers who are using the MVVM pattern because I could always hit F6, uh, no, F7. I could always hit F7 and I could drop to the code behind. But often my code isn't in the code behind, it's actually in the view model. Now I can just go to a reference anywhere inside my XAML, such as title, I hit F12, it takes me to my view model and the property inside. Yeah, by the way, like the pu MVVM purists might say, hey, you know what, it's not that common to specify my, my view model. Mm -hmm. It's all loosely associated and things right. like that. And that's perfectly fine. We have a bunch of features that we're going to demo in our data binding section that allow you to improve your design or XAML editing experience, even if you do not specify any data context in your XAML at all. Perfectly fine. In this case, for the sake of ease, I guess, we have sort of put it in there. But th that's perfectly fine as well. That's right. So all the MVVM purists out there who might have gotten worked up over that, go get a coffee, take a, take a relaxing coffee break. You'll be all right. We understand. All right. So. Um, oh, one final thing, Jerry. Do you want to show like F12 to discover documentation about various properties and things like that? Sure. All right. From inside here? Yeah. How about you put the cursor on the text block, and you want to know what the thing is all about? Right here. Yep. So I hit. So now I'm. Uh, this is the control that I'm interacting with. I don't necessarily have. This isn't a custom control or a user control. This is an, an actual framework control. I can hit F12 and it takes me into the object browser. Yeah. So so for example, if you're consuming a third-party SDK or mm. content from third parties where you actually don't have the source code, yeah. And you want to look at you know various available properties and their documentation. I mean, we pull up documentation from your XML files if you specify them like that. Uh, we allow you to navigate to the actual object in the object browser, so you can navigate around and sort of figure out what different properties exist, what they do, and so on and so forth. So, nice. so we made it really easy for you to do that as well. So it's not just text on a screen anymore. Everything is really, um, is really aware of what it actually is. So I can jump to a style, I can jump to a class, I can jump to a property, I can jump to an object definition. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually reading some of the questions coming in as well. I'll answer just one of them over here. Um, which, which, uh, which is from, uh, I believe it is, um, 
where can I find information about view model for Windows 8.1 XAML development? I think um, MVVM is, um, is, a, is a very popular topic. Uh, a lot of experts out there have lots of frameworks and lots of patterns and things like that. There are a lot of, if you just go to Bing and search for XAML MVVM, you'll find a lot of documentation and references and things like that that sort of allow you to sort of read uh, more about, you know, uh, MVVM patterns. That we are not going to be focusing on MVVM today at all. No. Uh, but that said, we will allude uh, to this topic every once in a while. We'll just probably to sort of... say view model quite often, though. Yeah. Yeah. And We're it's not going to be sort of teaching you the best practices of building an app or anything like that today, just about yet. Yeah. So when I build an app, often I build the view model business from scratch. A lot of people use third-party libraries, and they're just awesome. They really mm -hmm. are well thought out, well done. And uh, there are so many that it just hurts to try and say just one. Right. Yep. I wouldn't just say MVVM Lite, because then everybody would think that MVVM Lite was the only good one out there when that's not true. Yep. Perfect. Um, now, insight, now there are benefits. I'm a XAML developer. I'm obviously going to be writing XAML by hand like this. Um, another thing I might be doing uh, is coding in C Sharp. I have a couple cool things that I can do in there that are special as well. Talk to me about those. Yeah, absolutely. So, so. Um you know, one of the common things that you probably want to do is you, you essentially have a really complex class that's refactored to sort of have base classes with some implementation there. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's often important for you to quickly jump to the, to the place where the, the, the function is defined or the property is defined. Maybe just view the documentation or make a quick edit without losing context mm. of your bigger, let's say you want to do a quick bug fix to change the value of a constant without actually opening the file and doing edits. In Visual Studio 2013, we have a new feature called Peak, which is really popular. A lot of people like it. Can you demo that feature? Absolutely. So uh, here I am inside, let's just say this is a dreamed up scenario, but here I am inside um, the setter for title, and I can look at base.orientation, and I want to be able to peek in that. Now, what's the keystroke for peak? It's Alt F12. I mean, Alt F12. So it's just like F12 we were talking before. This is an alternate F12, That's <laughs> I correct. suppose. So I hit that, and uh, this pops up right below. It looks like a little tab. It even has a tab that uh, kind of feels like the tab in the top uh, document uh, well. And, uh, and I have this option. In fact, I could just quickly throw it up to the well and make it, or not throw it, but talk, oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. It. It's editable, by the way. You don't need to do that. Go uh -huh, ahead and I make can an go edit. right here? Yep. Uh, so I see the way orientation. I see its default. The default is all wrong. I need to change that so that it defaults instead. You get full IntelliSense, and, and note, note what happened at the top of the tabs. That particular base view model, .cs, is wow. now open as a document. Oh, I see it right here on the uh, left. And it has the star on it, which means you just made an edit. You don't need to switch to that if you don't care. But of course, if you want to do like a large scale refactoring or something like that, you might want to sort of switch your context to that particular tab and make your edits there. Perfect. So if I feel like this is, I've made the change that I need to, sometimes I won't make a change, right? I might just need to look and see how was this implemented to make sure I'm using it correctly. So I can just close it right now and everything is good. This stays open because it still needs to be saved. Right? Yep. That's the idea. Very cool. Very cool. That, so that's called peak. I like that a lot. Now, another uh, feature inside Visual Studio uh, for C Sharp developers is that um, Visual Studio is really calculating a lot about my code all the time behind mm -hmm. the scenes, and it can really expose that to me. So I'm going to turn it on. I can use the quick launch up here, and this feature is the code lens feature. So I can say code, code lens. And now if I'm looking for where it is, it's right here. It'll take me to uh, all languages code lens. I tap that, and it'll take me directly to the options where that's set up. I can see I've disabled it. Now I've turned it back on. I say OK, and I'm going to see a change here. You know, what, what, are, what am I seeing here? These references that are showing up? Uh, so those are sort of like uh, what, we have, what we have done is behind the scenes, we have calculated uh, the actual number of references to that particular property or function or class. And we are sort of indicating that to you just as an, as an overlay so you can sort of see uh, you know, the most common references and things like that. So go ahead and click one of those hyperlinks. Like this one? All yep. right. So you can see like we now pop up uh, some UI that sort of lets you see all of the places where you know, that particular reference is made. And now you can qu quickly jump to any one of those references by just double clicking on it. Oh, and, and I can know. even take a quick look at them without even navigating to that page if I wanted to see it really neat. Oh, yeah. wow, that's yeah. awesome. 
Absolutely. And, I could and uh, this also integrates with TFS. If we're using Team Foundation Server, it would also show me the history of the change for this line as well. Yep. Very powerful like that. We're not using TFS right here, so it doesn't have it, but uh, pretty neat nonetheless. Yeah. I just want to answer a couple of questions on the chat forum. Uh, one of them was from Robert, who is asking, what's the keystroke for Code Peak? The keystroke is you keep the Alt key pressed and then hit F12. So, right. so that's the that's the what's, what's, uh, that's as Jerry names it the alternate F12. <laughs> that's the way to sort of remember that. So F12 will take you to the particular function by opening the uh, by, by opening the CS file in its full glory. Alt F12 will allow you to do a quick peek at the particular content that you're interested in. Right. And just a, just a second question here as well. What about Blend and all the GUI thing that you've talked about? Absolutely, stay tuned. The next five sections are all going to be about Blend and visual editing and things like that. This section was primarily to just lay the landscape in terms of all of the other things that Visual Studio brings to you, the XAML developer. So That's stay right. tuned for modules two to five and six. And we'll cover a lot of blend. And don't forget, this is really this is really a, a session geared towards the XAML developer. Mm -hmm. And it's just not it's the wrong expectation to think that a XAML developer would never leave Blend. Yep. And uh, certainly the the wrong ex expectation to think they wouldn't leave Visual Studio either. There's too many benefits in both places, and we want to make sure they get them all. Yep. Perfect. <coughs> um, all right. So uh, help me out here. What's the next uh, step in our agenda here? Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and show. Is there any XAML IntelliSense features that we want to show on top? Let me just triple check my list. I want to make yeah. sure that we get them all. Uh, I think we kind of got through most of them. Now, now we'll do a deep dive of the data section at some point in the future, and we'll sort of show some of the data specific things. Um, so I think we kind of got pretty much everything that we wanted to cover there. Let me let me let me t tack on one thing that I really like here, and it's um, when I add things to the. Um, when I drag things from the toolbox into the designer, every once in a while, I'll drag them to the wrong place in the document tree. Yep. And uh, it'll be at the wrong location. I find myself just going cut, cutting it and pasting it where I actually meant for it to go. Sometimes because I forgot to select the one to make it or pin it to be active. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just because I got it wrong. And so we always have the document outline here. And the document outline shows the perfect hierarchy of how my page is set up. And so if I was right here and I wanted to add a text box, a text block, for example, but I wanted to make sure that text block was, block was on top of everything. Now, if I were to go here and select text block from my common controls here, and I would just grab it and drag it, I'm not 100% sure where it would end up. But uh, I have the ability now in Visual, Visual Studio 2013 to be able to grab that control. And so here's my control and drag it directly onto the document outline. The document outline is important because if I drag it all the way down here to the bottom, then I know for a fact that um, it is, as far as z-index, it's at the top top because the lower in the, the tree you are, the higher in the z-index you are. And I also know it's parented properly as well. I didn't mistakenly drag it onto the hub, drag it onto a grid that might be there or anything like that. It's a nice, powerful feature to be able to get it really accurate. And if I wanted to back this up because it's actually intended to be, let's say, a background of some kind, it's a rectangle or something, I could drag it up and down right here and be able to see it. My personal favorite is once I have something in the back, once I have something in the tree and uh, I don't want to grab it again, right? Every once in a while, I grab the background grid by mistake and I find myself moving it around. I can lock it and it's locked in place. And from the designer's point of view, I can go up there and I'll never mistakenly grab that again. Mm -hmm. right? Really valuable. I can hide it if I need to, but um, some, I, I use lock a lot more than I use the hide and show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, if you don't mind switching to my monitor for a second here. Okay, great. So uh, for the next 10 minutes, I think we should probably take them through a quick tour of Visual Studio's GUI features, as somebody called it. Like, okay. what are some of the features in Visual Studio that's available for the XAML developer to build their Excellent. user interfaces? This is going to be probably our last major stint uh, inside Visual Studio, outside of writing some code later in the in the session. Yeah. Um, where Let's, so let's take like five minutes to take a quick tour of the different panels in Visual Studio uh, and also see some of the controls in action while we are doing Got it. Like that. the document outline and all the other exactly. things we've got. Sure. So um, I'm going to take any one of Jerry's projects. I'm going to sort of start from scratch. I'm not going to use an existing uh, XAML file just to sort of keep things really simple. I'm going to add new item. And Visual Studio has, of course, a lot of templates. In this case, we are building a Windows Store app. Even if you're building a WPF or a Windows Phone app, you get almost the same set of templates. Uh, I'm going to create just a blank page just to show some of the concepts and let the designer boot for a second. 
And um, let's take a quick tour of some of the panels in Rear Studio. So Jerry showed you the toolbox. The toolbox is, um, is the place you would go to, to you know, view your controls. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the controls that Windows gives you out of the box, so there's the button and the hub and the image and things like that. Uh, we also show you controls that you may want to install that are given by third parties. So in this case, I'm building a Windows Store app. I want to use an ad control. Uh, I have installed the ad SDK, and the control shows up in the toolbox. I can just drag and drop the nice. control, and the ad gets integrated into my app. I configure the app, uh, ad to sort of uh, specify my you know, backend settings, and my, and my app is up and running. Okay. So the toolbox and it handles place. all the references for you. Yeah, as well, we'll so add the necessary nice references to, to the project, just drag and drop, so um, everything just works. Um, the document outline um, is the panel that you would go to to see the, the the visual representation of your markup in many ways. So in this case, we have the page, and I'm going to sort of just maximize the XAML editor. Um, when you make a selection, we automatically highlight the right entry in the XAML editor as well, and the visual design surface. So in this case, I've selected the grid. Um, my selection is now the grid on the design surface and my markup is also fully synchronized. Um, every time I change a selection, the same thing happens no matter where, where I do. If I put the cursor on the page in my XAML, the design surface, while well, you can't really see it, okay. the design surface has uh, selected the page as is evident from the property inspector over here. And the document outline is also fully synchronized as yeah. well. So the document outline, as Jerry said, is the place you'd go to, to sort of visually see the construction of your XAML tree and uh, you know, sort of make changes. It's the to closest it. thing we have to visualizing the logical tree yeah. inside XAML. By the way, when you're doing visual design, uh, it's very common. Let's go ahead and drag and drop a simple button control. Uh, let's resize that a little bit so people can see it. Um, often, you know, you are sort of uh, there is occlusion by controls up in the Z order, yeah. and you want to just temporarily hide the control so you can work with what's behind. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to the document outline and use the hide button over here yeah. to visually hide the control. It doesn't mean when you run the app you'll still have the button. It's not hidden uh, from yeah. the running application. It's just hidden in the visual designer so you can work with content that's behind the button. So now I can click and select the. The, the grid that's behind the button, whereas previously I would not have been able to do it. That's a big deal, especially when you're designing like a pop-up or something that's like that. That's correct. That's on top of yeah. it. Yeah. And similarly, like uh, we have the notion of locking controls. You want to make sure sometimes that as you're quickly working through your XAML and making changes, you don't accidentally make any changes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's really common is for people to sort of accidentally hit the button um, uh, or select the button on the design surface and hit the right arrow key as they're typing. Yeah. And they have suddenly changed their, their UI unknowingly. So you can go ahead and lock various controls uh, so that now when I select, I don't really select uh, the button. I'm selecting the grid. The button's almost transparent to me in terms of like the selection right. mechanisms. Um, and that's also pretty useful. Now, for what, what if I have, then, I see this controls. happen a lot. I'll have sometimes a grid, and then I'll have a stack panel. Inside that stack panel, I'll have another grid. Inside mm -hmm. that grid, I might have another stack panel. And they all take up the entire space. And I want to be able to select the back grid, let's yeah, say. To change the background color, right? It's right. pretty hard to do that um, you know, by sort of using direct selection metaphors. Um, we do have some mechanisms. For example, you can right click on the control, and you can see the s selection, the entire tree that's visible at that mouse click. Uh, and you can sort of select so you're the, over the button, but it still gives you the option for the grid and the page when you did exactly. that. Exactly. Let me do that one more time. I'm right clicking. Actually, to show this better, let's create two buttons. Uh, right on top of each other, so so you have two buttons that are sort of like um, sort of occluding each other. So I can there's no way for me to visually select the button in the back. There's no way you can see like whenever I'm selecting it, it sort of does. Now the options for selection, I can go to the document outline and select it. Yep. But the more common way of doing this would be you right click on the control mm -hmm. wherever your intention is to go, go do some selection, and we'll show you all of the. Uh, controls that are at that particular hit point, whatever is behind in Z index will sort of show you, and you can select the control that way as well. So, so we have done a lot of you know uh, work to make it easy for you to select and work with controls. Yeah. Uh, moving on, our quick tour of your studio. Uh, well, there was a layout option in that context menu. I think that's a neat option as well. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll go into that when we sort of go into blend and work with some basics of UI construction there. Yeah. Uh, but one of the one of the one of one of the things you can do is when you sort of visually construct controls, we set a, set a lot of arbitrary properties because we want to sort Sometimes of match your margin. intent. Exactly, because you're you're sort of dragging the thing out. Uh, you, you know, we have to do the right things to give you the right visual feedback. Right. But that's not often what you want. You want like a naked tag, a tag that has no other properties on it. That's what we call like a naked tag. So if you want to sort of right-click on uh, the control, 
hit layout and reset all, we clear out all of the properties that are related to layout and just give you like a blank tab and with the just a down it. Exactly. Very nice. So, so we'll again go into some of those more advanced topics in a, in a little bit. Okay. Now, go, uh, going through Visual Studio, we of course have the Visual Design Surface. Um, as you open multiple files, each of them becomes a new tab. Uh, some of the files don't um, don't have a visual design surface. For example, if you have a resource dictionary, yeah. there is nothing to visualize in terms of content. Um, so if you switch over to the design tab, you, we kind of give you a message that says, okay, you cannot really edit this in the design view. And by default, we sort of allow you to open the thing in full XAML view. Uh, but most files um, have like a visual design surface as well as the XAML editor. Um, you can change the order. So if you sort of want to horizontally split it or vertically split it, you can do that. You can minimize the XAML editor completely. If you you don't really care and just want to work with the visual design surface. Or you could just double click on the XAML tab and get like a full screen XAML view of that experience as well and sort of just uh, toggle back and forth. So you nice. can configure the, the, uh, the UI that you wanted. Uh, and finally, like there's the property inspector. Uh, the property inspector is where you'd go to, as the name indicates, set properties and view properties. We also have a section for viewing all the event handlers. You can double click on an event handler and we'll generate the event for you as well. The designer inside Visual Studio is excellent. I mean, really it is. And the designer inside Blend is excellent as well. Why, do they, why are they both excellent? Um, so so the, the, the intent of having a visual design surface in Visual Studio is the more common workflow here is you're doing a code-focused task. Mm -hmm. You're writing a bunch of code, and you want to sort of like quickly stitch together some UI and Get, it, get the app to work. You don't really care about finessing your UI or anything like that. So the intent of some of the panels in Visual Studio is to sort of give you that code-first experience with XAML-first experience for editing a XAML, yeah. and at the same time, get some visual preview. Now, if you want to do some minor tweaks here and there, like precise selection mm -hmm. or setting a property, you can use the property inspector or uh, the document outline. Yeah. But um, Blend actually gives you a lot more panels that allow you to do a lot more visual design things. And we'll get to that, right. like the states panel or the animation system in Blend. Um, it's much more designed to be um, you know, for, for design-focused activities. And if you are inside uh, Visual Studio, you're not getting a second-class experience either. The designer itself is the exact same designer as what you have inside Blend. That's yes. a shared code base, and so that's the reason it looks perfect inside Visual Studio and inside Blend. So that, that's one really neat piece, by it, for sure. Oh, absolutely. So uh, to sort of uh, end the section, uh, let's go ahead and take a tour of some of the controls that's available for you in Windows uh, Store apps. Yeah. Um, we will have a section later where you're going to sort of build an app from scratch that puts all of these controls through their, uh, you know, through their paces. Yeah. So don't worry, the audience on the screen, please don't worry if you don't actually understand the workings of this control, any of these controls. Jerry's going to take you through a much detailed tour. Yeah. So of course, there are the usual suspects. There is the button, or there is the checkbox, or the radio button. So those controls are there as well. But we, uh, or the Windows platform, has a number of user experiences that are unique, yeah. and we have controls that encapsulate that user experiences. So one of those user experiences is the hub pattern. If you've used Windows 8.1 and the Bing apps, this is pretty common. There is the hero image, and there are multiple sections that oh, the yeah. user can sort of sure. pan through. Um, the, the, uh, there is a control for that, and you just drag and drop the hub control. Um, Visual Studio and Blend sort of create mm. some starter XAML for you. So we, we have the header section specified. You can change this to, let's say, call it the movies. And in Visual Studio 8.0, Oops. how many times did we go through aligning the header just right? And here's a control that just puts it yeah. there where it needs to be. Yeah, so, so all you have to do is right-click on the control, go to your layout option, reset all, so you get like full screen experience. The control does all of the right things in, in terms of encapsulating margins and things yeah. like that, so you don't have to worry about all of that. Just by configuring basic properties, you get your hub pattern up and running. One, one of the misconceptions around the hub uh, control is it is not a data control. It is truly a layout control. Uh, it doesn't have an item source or anything like that. It's really meant to have things, a, a set of curated content laid out in the proper way that it feels excellent in the ecosystem, gives that visual alignment. Yeah, and by the way, like you can see, like um, one of the things about Blend is as you're selecting uh, different sections, uh, let's go ahead and add a few more sections so we can sort of see this in action. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm selecting a couple of sections, I'm hitting Control C, and I'm just hitting Control V, so I have a whole bunch of sections. Nice. Um, now one of the things about the visual design surface in Visual Studio and Blend is as you're selecting different sections, 
we sort of scroll the section into view uh -huh. so you can visually see what that section is yeah. and you can sort of relate to the content uh, much better and you can see the, f the, the, the design experience requires you to see something. We sort of allow you to do that by scrolling right. the so section. So you could have so many sections that they're off the edge, and then all of a sudden you don't really have a visual experience. Yeah. So let all. me just. Uh, uh, by the way, the visual design surface has a has a zoom setting. You can uh, use the control key mm -hmm. and uh, use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Nice. Um, if you just use the mouse wheel, we do uh, 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 a scroll gesture, so we sort of scroll the content. Mm -hmm. But we also have a drop down here to precisely control your scroll value. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm going to select 33% so I can see everything on the design surface. I can hit the space bar key, and I get this icon for sort of panning my content. Very, uh -huh. a very, uh, very common gesture if, you, if you've used design tools before. And you Wait, can precisely so you use the space bar key? That's correct. Oh. Beautiful. Wow. Um, so that allows you to sort of precisely position your content where you want it. I love it. And that way you can now sort of make edits to your uh, different sections and you can select them, see them, and make it, edits. Is it possible for me to see all of my sections at one time? Absolutely. And I, I was trying to sort of avoid that topic because that leads us to the device panel. Right. And we're going to go into the details of the device panel at a later point in time. Uh, but, but in the device panel, which is your one-stop shop to see uh, settings that you can apply to your app, Mm -hmm. uh, that you can simulate at design time. S there's an option to control the size of the display that your app is running in. Um, you, you have a variety of options, right from a seven inch um, you know, uh, uh, tablet all the way to like a full screen experience um, at full HD. Um, so so let's, let's go ahead and select um, a very common like 96 DPI HD mm -hmm. resolution configuration. Um, you can see like you can now see more sections. Uh, yeah. But that's not your question. Your question is how do you see all the all sections? Of them, yeah. uh, there's oh, an option in the big. device panel that says that sort of reads auto. If you select it, you can sort of see every single section in your app. Now, of course, this is not looking pretty because the sections don't really have any content. But as you add content, you can see your entire hub page uh, at a single shot. So as it gets um, taller and taller, it would grow to yeah. show more and more. As it's wider and wider, it grows to show yeah. more. And this is my one way to see everything. Yeah, and this is not some nifty trick. It, often what happens is you want to sort of synchronize colors across multiple sections and things like that. It'd be really painful for you to select a section, select a color, switch back to the previous section and apply it. If you can see the entire hub at once, you can use tools, the various tools we have. For example, we have, um, if you go to the background property um, and change it to some, some, some color here, we have the color picker that allows you to sort of select a particular color from another section and so on and so forth. So, so, so seeing the entire hub page at once allows you to do some of these things. So let's go ahead and undo some of these things that we just did. <laughs> and uh, change back to our thing here. Let's see a couple more controls. We are kind of running out of time, so let me just <coughs> really quickly go over one more control that's really common to Windows apps, which is the app bar. Okay. So the app bar is this place in your app where you see all of your commands, and you can sort of interact with the commands. You can use the swipe up gesture to bring up the app bar and then interact with commands. If you have a really good, good experience for working with the command bar or the app bar control. Wait, wait, so, I want to pause you just for a second and talk about that. Uh, so I see two, two controls. I see right. an app bar control and a command bar control. Developers are asking me, you know, what's the difference? Which one should I choose and when? What do you say to them? Uh, the app bar control, I see um, it as a Wild Wild West control. Mm. You kind of... It, it allows you to bring some UI into screen, and then you own putting content into that UI. You can put anything in there, right from an app bar button all the way so to fancy graphics. if you want a slider graphics. in there, or a text box in there, or you just name it, the app bar will take anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and the command bar control, if you're familiar with Windows Phone, it is similar to the Windows Phone app bar control, where there is very little customization possible, but it allows you to hit the 95% of the cases that you sort of want to hit, hit with your app bar. So if I don't so, have custom controls inside my app bar, my default would be command bar. Yeah. You can, of course, style your buttons and things like that even in the command bar, mm -hmm. but, but it's a really quick way to create a, what I'd call a more structured app bar, the one that you commonly see in 95% of apps out there. Uh, and where the app stuff. bar is just a grid that you throw everything into, an app bar only accepts buttons, but it also has a primary and secondary region that yeah. as the user starts making my app more narrow, right. it right. starts to pull those out and right. only shows primary. Those things are all taken care of for you encapsulated into the command bar. 
so you don't have to worry about how the app bar sort of change their look and feel and right. things like that. It's all encapsulated for you. If you're writing the app bar uh, control, like you, you sort of own some of those problems um, and dealing with those problems as well. Got it. So, um, so just to show a quick example of the command bar experience, um, to create a command bar, you could do a couple of things. You could right click. Uh, if you see the page um, thing in the document outline, there are a couple of properties that we show here yeah. uh, called the top app bar and bottom app bar. An app bar is primarily more commonly found in the bottom of your app, so we're going to use the bottom app bar here. Right. right click on the app bar, you can add the command bar through that. Just right like that. Or, like you say, you can drag and drop uh, the command bar from um, the asset or the toolbox into Different your app. experience, exact same result. Yeah, you, you get pretty much the command bar tag, right? Um, now, one of the things about Visual Studio and Blend is when you select the command bar, we sort of expand it for you so you can visually see what you're doing. Mm. Um, now, the command bar itself has two properties on it, primary commands and secondary commands. Primary commands are the ones that usually appear on the right-hand side of the app bar, and secondary commands are the ones that appear on the right-hand side of the app, left-hand side of the app bar. So I'm going to right-click on primary commands and add an app bar button. So let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on. So that's your app bar button. It has this default emoji icon. Yeah. But we have a rich value editor for configuring, oops, my bad, for all of those icons as well. So if I was a developer and I said, to my, and I said I'm never going to use the designer, this is a really good reason to use the designer. That's These, correct. This value editor right here. Right. So you can select, let's say, the folder icon or something right. like that, right? So that's How did we do this before? We had, the, we had all the, the options to choose from, from uh, standard styles. Or we would go into the character map and get it from there. Or we would go download one. Right. I mean, it was a, such right. a hassle. Here it is. Bam, I'm done. Absolutely. And then you can also do things like adding a separator. So that's your separator. Nice. Um, right click again and add another <coughs> app bar button. So that's your sort of, sorry about this Including thing. a toggle button, which I think is a big deal, right? Because I think a lot of us had to uh, restyle a button because there wasn't a toggle button. And now, now there is because that on off is a is really important in a lot of um, application concepts. Yeah, so, so we'll go into some of these controls in greater detail um, right. in later sections, and we'll actually build an app that uses many of these controls, so you kind of see not just how to visually construct them, but how to write code against them as well, how to write an event handler, how to hook up a command, and so on and so forth. Perfect. So we'll get to that in, in, in a later section. Uni, let's take a 10-minute break, let Absolutely. everybody uh, go get a drink, and uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes for Module 2, and we'll see you then. Thank you.